Greetings, and welcome back to Strike Fighters 2 Vietnam. When we last left the series, Lieutenant Horner was finishing up his deployment, flying A-1 Sky Raiders of VA-52 off the USS Ticonderoga. And that ship and squadron, uh, their cruise was scheduled to end in March of 66. Well, Lieutenant Horner has pulled some strings, called in some favors, you know, not really sure how he managed it, but arranged to transfer out of VA-52 and has transferred to a squadron that is coming on station in March of 66. So we have now joined VF-211 Checkmates flying F-8E Crusaders off the USS Hancock, which is CVA-19. It's another Essex-class ship, and, uh, and they're just arriving on station, and so... Uh, no time for Horner to go home. He transferred right to the right to the Hancock and and got checked out in these Crusaders and, and got his his carrier quals done. So now we're ready for combat. 01 March of '66. Before we go any further, let's take a quick look at our pilot records and uh, and see where Lieutenant Horner stands in terms of stats at the end of the last campaign. Here are Horner, Hornet Horner here, Lieutenant. Uh, Fifty-eight thousand points. A rating of 72%. 209 kills, 101 of which were vehicles, which are AAA, mostly uh, AAA and trucks, and 100 and, uh, 108 buildings. One friendly fire, still don't remember uh, what that was about. It may have been in one of the first missions. Did we accidentally bomb some friendly troops? Unbeknownst? I don't quite remember. And we were shot down, uh, shot down once. For a kill ratio of 209 to 1, we have flown for 10 hours and 17 minutes so far, all of which have been in the A1H Sky Raider. And we have a 94% uh, mission success rate. Uh, com campaigns complete started. We're going to ignore this from here on out because these are. If this is going to remain 0% because I'm going to be bouncing around um, for the video series. I'm probably not going to end up getting to the end of any campaigns. So... We're not going to worry about that, so just just ignore that. But we can still look at successful missions flown. That's going to be an accurate uh, reflector of what we've done. So yeah, so that's that's where Lieutenant Horner stands for now. Now that it's 1966, you'll notice that the hangar radio will be playing time-appropriate music. Uh, maybe you noticed or did not notice uh, up till now in the last 11 episodes, all the music that's been played has been from 1965 or earlier. Uh, there was a couple of songs. Some of the Ventures tunes were from 62, 63, I think. But uh, but all stuff that you would have heard at the time. Now that it's 66, we get to add some new music to the mix. So let's get down to business. Our, <laughs> our first mission with this fighter squadron is going to be to uh, attack some warehouses. Kind of the same old, same old. But that's okay. We're gonna, we gotta ease into this new aircraft and the new squadron. So we're going to strike a strategic target located in the VIN warehouse storage area. We're going to attack and destroy the enemy warehouse. Call sign is Anvil. Two F-8E Crusaders take off time of 1239 in the afternoon. Looking at the loadout here, we have four sidewinders, AIM 9Ds, which is the, uh, the more advanced version. We have AIM 9Bs as well, but those are older and slightly inferior. The Ds are better. I believe they're more maneuverable and they have better uh, tracking avionics. So we're going to stick with those for now. Uh, we have 280 of them on board ship. So if we get low, we may have to switch to 9 Bs. But 280 missiles, that's a lot to go through. <laughs> but who knows? Um, and eight 500 pound bombs, our Mark 82s, that we're going to sling under the wings. And, uh,. So it'll be 16 bombs between the two of us, and we're going to take out that warehouse. Now let's look at the old map. We can see that our new target area is up here, this, this VIN area. If you recall before, our operating areas were mostly down here in this area, south of Dong Hoi and around the KFAT area. In fact, our last mission was into the KFAT uh, barracks and blew that up. But now we're shifting with the new squadron a little bit further to the north. 
Now you can see um, that Yankee Station has a lot of squadrons involved. The game uh, has five carriers on station right now. We'll see those when we take off. We'll take a look at them. That is historically inaccurate. Usually it was only three carriers on station. I think that there was like one, there was one instance where there was four uh, carriers, I believe. But usually it was three, and they were um, they were each assigned a a time of day to launch strikes. So one carrier would be 12 hours during the day. The next carrier carrier would fly 12 hours during the night, and then the third carrier was assigned the swing shift, where they would go from noon to midnight, and therefore be able to cover additional aircraft for for both of the other two carriers. So, lots of squadrons here. Lots of squadrons down here at Da Nang. Um, these are all Air Force guys. Uh, Phantoms, F-100s, uh, some some Crusaders, some uh, yeah, Marine squadrons. Also additional Marine squadrons here at Chu Lai. Uh, Air Force A-1s out of Pliku. Tamaran Bay. Uh, the Saigon. So, you can just see, oh, here's our B-52s out of Utapaw, uh, F-105s up here, um, Voodoo's, and some, some F-4s up here. Uh, lots of friendly squadrons scattered all over. Um, you can see that it's already going to be way more busy than our previous campaign was, especially with the addition of these enemy fighter squadrons. There's definitely, uh, well, there's AN-2s, but here's some MiG-17s out of Fukien. MiG 21s. Uh, so, so we're going to be on the lookout for those guys. Probably be tangling with them here in Crusaders at some point. Uh, let's see. Our initial point 5,900 feet and 12 minutes after takeoff. Kind of the same old, same old, right? New squadron, new plane. Huh. <laughs> Same altitudes, same mission as before. But that's okay. Like I said, we're, we're sticking our toes in here. The plane's going to handle a lot different. We've got different uh, fuel burns. So. Uh, boop, boop, boo. Well, I believe that's it. Oh, no, no. Let's take a look at the roster real quick. Here I am is Anvil 1. 33 missions. Anvil 2 is going to be Ensign Dixon today. You can see we have a whole new cast of characters. Some names that we're not familiar with. We'll get to know them over time. We may lose several of them. But, uh, you know, maybe not. We'll have to see. Okay. So that's it. And we're going to head up on board our new ship. And I'll see you up there for our launch of the first mission in our Crusaders. Ready for launch here off the Hancock. And a dual launch with number two. Definitely not realistic. As we climb up and away from our new carrier. The new item we're not familiar with is the radar obviously Sky Raider did not have such black magic but we got one now and we have the, let's see we have search mode we have boresight mode and we also have a ground map mode and we've got two distances 20 miles and 40 miles that we can switch between so we can see on the radar here we can see the fleet scattered out in front of us there's the Hancock as we pull away. We can see here we've got one, two, three, it's actually six. There's six carriers being drawn right now, but one of them uh, is the Ticonderoga, which as I stated, should probably be leaving to go home. Uh, very shortly. Their their deployment should be over um, within this month. 
Just want to take a little, uh, a little spin by here, because now look who is out. USS Enterprise. Now deployed to the area. That's the first we've seen of her. for bogeys already. So like usual, let's set our, our ripple quantity and interval. I guess 60 milliseconds. We have a we have a more limited ripple quantity than on the than on the Sky Raider, but no big deal. And as we come up to 5,900 feet, I'm not going to pull the throttle back to. Let's see. We're going to do. Thank you. We're going to do 5,000. Uh, pounds per hour. And you'll see that puts us at 90% RPM. And we're on course as we have several more flights launching to our right. The target is closer, and this jet is much faster than our old Sky Raider, but I still have time to chat before we get into the action, so let's talk about our new aircraft. The F-8 Crusader was built by Vought Aircraft in Dallas, Texas, and served the U.S. Navy and Marines from 1957 until 1976. The French Navy used their custom-built export model, the F-8E-FN, all the way up until 1999. It was the last American fighter designed with guns as the primary weapon, earning it the nickname the last of the gunfighters. Powered by the Pratt & Whitney J-57, the F-8 could reach Mach 1.86 at altitude and was the first American fighter to break 1,000 miles an hour. Experience in the Korean War had shown that 50 caliber guns were no longer effective in air combat, so the Crusader was built with larger Colt Mark 12 20mm cannons, four in total. Unfortunately, the Mark 12s ended up having a poor reputation for being inaccurate and for jamming frequently, especially under high G maneuvers. Also, their low ammo capacity meant only 13 seconds of sustained fire. This was remedied by one squadron who wired switches into the cockpit to be able to select two of the four guns at a time, a modification later officially adopted by Vought for all Crusaders. This halved the volume of lead being fired, but allowed for longer firing times. Despite their last gunfighter nickname, only four out of the 19 Crusader victories in Vietnam were actually gun kills. The other 15 MiGs were taken down with Sidewinder missiles. The most unique feature of this aircraft is its variable incidence wing. In aerodynamics, angle of attack is the difference between the wing cord and relative wind, and is changed by pitching the aircraft. Angle of incidence, however, is the factory design difference between wing cord and the axis of the fuselage. This angle is set by designers to get the best lift for whatever flight envelope the plane is designed for. On the Crusader, the entire wing assembly rotates up 7 degrees for landing and takeoff. This changed the angle of incidence, creating more lift while allowing the nose to remain down for better visibility. This innovation won the Crusader design team the 1956 Collier Trophy, an award for improving the aviation industry. Despite the innovative wing, the Crusader was known as an ensign eliminator and was apparently not easy to fly. Carrier operations were particularly unforgiving. The Crusader didn't recover well from high sink rates, a characteristic that has gotten the better of me here in the game. The castering nose wheel made deck operations difficult. 
The low intake was a hazard for deck personnel earning the nickname The Gator because it could snap you up if you got too close. Crusaders only operated from the old, small Essex carriers during the war. Carrier landings in general are often described as hitting a postage stamp in the middle of the ocean, and the Essex classes were even smaller. Hitting an Essex deck in our A1s was manageable, but doing it in a big heavy Mach 1 fighter is a white knuckle experience. Once it lands, the airplane rapidly eats up the landing area. Also, because of the Crusader's landing speed, the oil-burning carriers had to call flank speed to get as much wind across the deck as possible, and often, the stacks would belch black smoke that would obscure the landing area. Of the total 1,261 planes built, 1,106 had been involved in mishaps by the time the type was retired from the fleet, meaning that 88% of all Crusaders built were involved in incidents. 170 F-8s were lost in Vietnam, mostly from accidents and ground fire, with only three actually being downed by MiGs. Before you think it was all bad, the Crusader had some amazing qualities as well. In 1960, a pilot took off from Naples, Italy with the wings folded, climbed to 5,000 feet before noticing, and then returned to land safely. The J-57 engine was a powerhouse that pilots loved and the Crusader had a thrust to weight that allowed an almost vertical climb. With 18,000 pounds of thrust, the plane could outclimb MiGs, a tactic which the American pilots relied on time after time during fights. The 1960s were the infamous Age of the Missile, the time when out-of-touch experts declared that dogfighting was done and fighters were only designed to shoot down Russian bombers. Maneuverability was thought unimportant and guns were eliminated. See both the F-102 and the F-4 for good examples. During this time, one of the few planes capable of actually tangling with nimble MiG-17s was the Crusader, and it proved that dogfighting was not to be discarded. Despite not claiming many kills, the guns of the Crusader still scared the North Vietnamese Air Force pilots. After attacking head-on, the NVAF pilots would attempt to disengage after F-8s would fire a burst from their cannons. This would then end up putting them in perfect position for a distance sidewinder shot. One instance recounts pilot Jerry Tucker of our current VF-211 squadron, who got a sidewinder lock on a lone MiG-17, but before he could fire, the MiG pilot ejected. F-4 and F-8 pilots had an extreme rivalry, each thinking their plane the superior choice. And Crusader pilots loved to say that the MiG pilot had preferred bailing out rather than face Crusaders, and he probably would have stayed in the cockpit had it been a Phantom. Regardless of how true that opinion is, the guns and the maneuverability of the Crusader certainly took away the advantages the MiGs enjoyed in combat against other American planes. In 1966, North Vietnam only had 55 MiG-17s and 15 MiG-21s in its entire Air Force, meaning that each aircraft was a valuable commodity. So, it makes sense that the NVAF pilots would rather try to live to fight another day than to roll the dice with a Crusader. Those are MIGs. Requesting help. Set this ground map up. Red 
What's our status? Oh, good. Woo! Look at that fur ball behind us. Selecting bombs. Oh man. All right, there's our facility. That's our primary target right down there to the left. Anvil 2 is behind me, slightly to the north. Right into the heart of it. And we're going to jettison those bomb racks. Two should be coming in. Yeah. Was that my wingman? Yeah, he's good. Okay, wingman. Rejoin. to this guy right here. Fox 2. Didn't track. Oh, somebody else got him though. Somebody else going down over there. Do we have anything else close? Should be able to see them. I got one, I got one. There we go. That's a fresco. And that's him falling out of the sky. Well, I got him. 
Seems like everyone has this pretty well covered, I suppose. Switch back to cannon. Oh, MiG 21s. Up behind us. Pretty far away, though. that fuel flow back down to 6,000 and <sighs> bit of excitement there nothing came of it from the air but we fired our first sidewinder to no effect There's a bison flight to our right. Oh, who's that? That's... A4s, I believe. Three miles to our waypoint. Where is my wingman in all this? He's okay, he's behind and to the left. turn back out to sea, we're attracting the attention of uh, some Vietnamese flak gunners. And we've got four ships. Holy moly! Almost collided with those A4s. <laughs> That's what I get for not checking to my left before turning. That's a no-no. That's on me. Plane captain's gonna have to hose out the cockpit to get the poop out of it. Cause I just shit myself <laughs> when those A4s came over the canopy. As I was starting to say, we can see the fleet already on the scope in front of us. The Sidewinder is a well-known and reliable short-range missile today, with thousands of units made for use in countries all over the world including Russian AA-2 Atolls, the reverse-engineered copy of the Sidewinder. The missile first appeared in use in 1956 as the AIM-9 Bravo, and its early service was anything but dependable. Its tracking sensors were highly susceptible to background radiation, and uh, I remember Chuck Yeager in his autobiography talking about how the first Sidewinders ignored targets and just locked onto the sun or clouds instead. 
Early tube electronics were often unreliable, causing missiles to not track and go ballistic, or for the proximity fuse to not detonate as the missile passed harmlessly by a target. They wouldn't work if launched in excess of 2 Gs, had a tracking angle of only a few degrees, and had a short range of 2.6 nautical miles. The stats for missile launches between 1965 and 1968 show that you only had a 16% chance to get a kill with a Sidewinder. This led to the practice by pilots of ripple firing, launching two Sidewinders in a row at a target to increase their odds of hitting. The Navy recognized the missile's shortcomings in the late 1950s and produced the Navy-specific AIM-9 Delta. This version had a much wider engagement envelope, was more maneuverable, had a stronger engine, changed the type of proximity fuse, and had a different warhead that exploded out a ring of shrapnel which sliced into enemy aircraft. This continuous rod warhead would often chop the tails off of MiGs just behind the wings when they detonated up the tailpipe. Gulf and hotel versions of the missile would also see service during Vietnam, each offering more improvements with the hotel eliminating tube electronics entirely in favor of the first solid-state circuit boards. While most Sidewinders are infrared homing, the Charlie version was semi-active radar guided and was developed specifically to be used with our Crusaders in an effort to give them all-weather radar missiles that they otherwise lacked. Only 1,000 of these were produced and very few, if any, seem to ever have been used. They were all later converted to anti-radar missiles in the 1980s as the AGM-122 sidearm. The Air Force developed its own line of the missile, the Echo, Juliet, and Novembers, and today the X-Ray is the latest version of the missile, beginning service in 2003 across all U.S. branches. The AIM-9X is jammed full of modern technology and can acquire targets up to 90 degrees off its nose. The Department of Defense has a contract to support Sidewinder production through 2055, meaning that the missile will have been in frontline service all over the world for 100 years. We can see that the other squadrons are all making their way back to the fleet as well. Calls of, uh, of uh, bingo fuel means that people are now definitely turning around and heading home. The turning and burning is, has used up the fuel of, of all of our fighters, and they're going to disengage and head back home. And whatever remains of the Vietnamese fighters will also head back home shortly as well. It seems like maybe they got a bit of an ass kicking today. All right, passing over the independence there. There's our old home off of our nose. There's Ticonderoga. Bringing the throttle down, we're going to descend down to 3,000 feet. There's Enterprise again off to our side. This is a third-party model that I downloaded from uh, the Combat Ace Forum a couple of years ago. The stock Enterprise was just a was just another forestall class with the skinny superstructure, and uh, it just it bugged me because the Enterprise was its own class of ship and had a very distinctive. Uh, square superstructure and so I went out looking for another version of it and I found one. Interesting to note on that Enterprise model it has full deck lights and a fully working flows of uh, the meatball which you may remember when I talked about that system I had said that the game doesn't support. Well the game itself supports it it turns out it's just that the stock aircraft carriers in the game do not use any lights whatsoever and they just have that that really that texture uh, on the flows system so third party 
models have it, and maybe all the carriers in the North Atlantic DLC have it. I don't know. I don't own that DLC. Um, it's an official DLC that came out for carrier use in the North Atlantic in the European uh, campaigns. You know, Cold War uh, 70s, 80s campaigns. So at some point, when we reach the Enterprise, we'll actually be able to use all that. So that's an exciting look into the future, seeing what we can look forward to. Let's see, is our wingman getting set up for landing? Yes, he is. He's got the speed brakes out. All right, we can see two blips on our radar, on our ground radar there. Uh, coming in about, what would that be? It's about 10 miles out. Um, the last two carriers in the whole fleet were, we're way out to the, uh, to the east this time, so we've had to pass over most of the other fleet uh, to get to our carrier. To the right is CVA-61, the USS Ranger, and then Hancock is the, is the blip that's over to our left. And we can see that the Ranger is is in is in, in sight now. We can zoom in a little bit. There's the Ranger, and uh, oh, and there to the left is the USS Hancock, in visual range now. And, the lead. and there's the call to turn to final. If you look in the upper right uh, portion of our instrument panel, you can see that the ILS has come alive. Uh, another system that I thought that the game didn't support and I, I uh, reported erroneously in a previous um, video that the game didn't have. Uh, just the, the Sky Raiders didn't support it. Um, so now here I'm, I'm seeing that it's, uh, I'm remembering that it's actually in place. So that will actually guide us down correctly uh, to the flight deck, although the, the glide slope is a little shallow, so we're not going to be following that, but the uh, you can see here that we're well above the glide slope and also uh, right on center line as we're coming in over over the ship. And there we go, passing right over the ship. And we're going to go out to about one mile distance to start the break. You can see the air brakes down, they're underneath the aircraft. And as we do our break, I'm going to descend to 1,000 feet uh, for the pattern altitude on the downwind for landing. Drop the tootsies. There you can see the variable incidence wing is seven degrees up, the little hydraulic ram that pushes up. You can see the entire assembly rotates up to give us that extra lift we need um, for landing and taking off. Ooh, getting a little bit of buffeting here. So I want 150 knots for approach uh, in this aircraft. Any lower than that, any slower, and we get uh, we start to get extreme um, uh, rates of descent. The plane starts to drop out of the sky like a brick, and then just like in real life, like I mentioned earlier, it's very difficult to recover in a short amount of time. So we're rolling out on final. Hornet calling the ball on visual approach. ILS is showing center line above the glide slope, but that's okay. I'm I'm right where I want to be. Oh, and then we're at 140. You can see the buffeting starting. Got to be real careful about that. Uh, correcting. Oh, and catching the wire and almost running out of deck. Okay. Whew. Had to make use of those wheel brakes. 
But hey, that stopped us right on the uh, port side elevator. <laughs> so, bring the hook and the flaps in. And you can see the, uh, the incident wing coming back down. So there we have it. That's our first, uh, first landing in the Crusader. Uh, first mission done. Uh, mission successful. We did some good damage. We got a little taste of, uh, of uh, a little bit of air combat. Had a sidewinder that just went ballistic. Uh, didn't track. No big deal. Um, that was not our mission. Our mission was to, to blow up those warehouses, and we did. So, uh, yeah. Fun, interesting mission. And um, let's go down to the debriefing and see how we fared. Okay. We struck our target, and we got that warehouse. We got it good. Blew that up. Uh, th only 34 minutes long, this mission. Outstanding success. Huh. And uh, promoted to Lieutenant Commander right out of the gate. Interesting. If we look at our stats. I got three kills with my eight bombs. Oh, that's, that's funny. I hit that whole row of uh, buildings. I was expecting more than that. But uh, Ensign Dixon came in. He got six kills with his bombs, including hitting the primary target. So uh, so good job, Ensign Dixon. He did a much uh, better job than I. I fired that one sidewinder for a miss. Um, uh, Frank Dixon, now com nine combat missions. Okay. So that's it. Uh, pretty interesting first mission. Little overwhelming. Um, just the amount of stuff going on. There's a lot of sensory input. So uh, next time out, I mean, we're, we're going to see. What, at some point, we will be assigned actual escort or MIG cap missions, in which case it will be our job to shoot down MIG. So, uh, so don't feel bad that I didn't really get in any combat today. You know, it wasn't the mission assigned to us for today, and uh, we'll get plenty of chances later. I'm not worried about it. So uh, we'll see you next time for, the, for our next adventure. <laughs>